The worst thing you can do as an artist is be regimented with everything you do. Remember, this is an art, not a science. Art is flowing constantly. Give and take. Oh, I can't do it this way. Okay, I'll do it that way. Well, that doesn't work. We'll do it this way. It's always thinking up new ways of doing things. So, <laughs> so this week, let me just get out of the way. Um, a couple of bell ends on YouTube. <laughs> well, ah. I'll tell you wh- wh- one thing that's. Th- I mean, we should. I should just preface this by saying, um, you know, this podcast is basically the way podcasts work. If you do it properly, is you have to pay for it to be hosted, which we do. And so it goes to a hosting company and that hosting company basically generates what's known as an RSS feed and it sends it out to various locations of your choosing and places like Spotify and iTunes and that you have to tell it where to send it. And um, there's a few different companies that do this. Um, And our podcast, like most podcasts, is... Is for your ears only. Well, that's right. <laughs> it's just, but one of the one of the recent uh, destinations that came up, like uh, it was about a year and a bit ago, is when they came out with like, oh, you can now upload to Spotify. Would you like to? And there's a procedure. You, you fill out the thing, and then it sends it off. And there's one for YouTube, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. And you'll notice, I think, from about five or six episodes ago, we started uh, uploading to YouTube. But because there were like ten destinations, like SoundCloud, mm-hmm. like all these other places, I don't manually send the file ten times to all these different places so one of the places it automatically uploads to is youtube which means you have to uh, add an image or embed an image into the file so that the image is there anyway so it's just another place to put our audio content but yeah there was someone that basically i'll just say basically he took offense that a it wasn't a video and this is a video platform so it should have been a video and b it wasn't a video that would help him bearing in mind that this is a free podcast that you don't have to pay for <laughs> and I had let him down by not producing a video. The fact that there are fucking loads of videos on there is by the by. But uh, yeah, it was just quite funny. And it went on and on and on. And uh, yeah, it was just one of those things. So I've deleted all the comments because it just wasn't helping. But it just seemed to be but, hilarious. But it, was, it was good for a laugh. It was good for a laugh, but it was just predicated. The entire thing was predicated on the fact that, but this is where videos are and this isn't a video. So you've let me down. That's basically the, the entire premise of his, his position. And I was just like, it's just a podcast. What were, it, what were we thinking? It was literally like picking up, uh, uh, I don't know, like a, like a Volkswagen Beetle manual on how to repair the engine, picking that up in a bookshop, realizing there was no plot or characters or dialogue in there and throwing it across the room and saying that all books are shit and I'm never going to read again. That's basically what he did with the podcast. It was very funny. It's like, <laughs> okay, that's fine. So I'll get that out of the way. Oh, and somebody else put, commented on, you know, the um, video we did of um, repairing edges. Yeah. <laughs> Someone said, oh, that's fine. If you've got all the materials to repair it. And I just thought, oh, well, presumably if you got to the point where you've made the fucking piece, then you would have, all the pieces but i was thinking about it i mean that's a good point and we should probably look at various things that you could use but honestly if i was to use toilet paper and mayonnaise there'd be someone going well it's fine if you can afford mayonnaise so it's like i can't fucking win yes (laughs) if you get hired to do a body painting job that requires an airbrush get an airbrush well that's fine if you can afford an airbrush you know it's that kind of thing so it's just like well yeah maybe maybe fighting words maybe if you maybe if the job you're doing doesn't need good edges to repair and that's fine but if for me if the if the cost of the edge repair is necessary then it's i just i, I don't even know we're arguing the point it was just it's just annoying i don't mind if people say the sound was shit or i didn't like how you did that or that that's a valid point but i don't know to point at a fish and say it's really crap because it can't ride a bike that makes you a twat not the fish do you know what i mean mm. so um <laughs> anyway let's get past all that um we got a good uh, a good interview this weekend, but I just wanted to run by um, this weekend, this episode. I don't know why I said this weekend. Um, we had a couple of good email questions, um, and I know you responded to them too. There was like a couple of months where I was just like not on this email thing at all. So you'd done all the responding on that. But um, we had a good one from uh, Rick Connolly, who suggested the sculpt release agent tip. 
Um, he, mm-hmm. he suggested, oh, it's not so much a question, but I've noticed you've been using dental separator like Alcoat to help float off the sculpture from the core. I'd like to know that I'm currently using Elmer's washable plastic glue for two more reasons. One, that when I've used the traditional separator, even after drying with a hairdryer, my plasticine would slide, making it difficult to build up my sculpture, which I've I've had that, I don't know what that means. Um, but with this glue, the plasticine grabs quicker, especially when I'm tapering an edge. Uh, and two, these glues are um, uh, like clag. I've never used clag. That sounds like a, a condition that needs treatment. Um, Elmer's, <laughs> sounds like caveman. It does. Caveman clag. Caveman clag. You eat too much red meat, arg. Um, <laughs> Uh, Elmer's and wallpaper paste dissolves extremely fast. So, um, yeah, he, and he also got back to say, oh, I forgot to mention uh, with this cheat, you could still add a small amount of dental separator. So I think that's really cool. So I picked up some Elmer's glue because it's one of those things that for years nice. we didn't really have here, I don't think, or if we did, it wasn't easy to find. So I picked up right. some Elmer's glue, which is the school glue, because I'm going to give that a try, and some washable clear Elmer's glue as well. So... Thank you very much, Rick Connolly, for that. That's water soluble. Fucking really, yeah. Well, they're that's, water soluble. That's, it needs yeah. to be water soluble. But it's also, you know, they're designed to wash out of clothes when kids are clumsy and messy. So, um, so the fact that it washes out would presumably mean it does, you know, soak out. So I, because I've never done it, because I've always just used the thing you're supposed to use. Um, yeah. And when someone says, "Oh, I've used this," I'm like, "Who else to cause this week? Um, let them dry out." Incidentally, I would say I tend to let them dry out like for a few days and also i make them really thin make the plaster super thin because a lot of people just fill the face up solid and then the next day it's not dry and it's like well yeah because yeah, i know for, Kazu likes forever to, to, soak yeah, to bake yeah. his molds out for like you know 60 degrees or 50 degrees for three or four hours which is a great idea but he also makes them really thin um but uh, so I, I do them really thin mm-hmm. or as thin as i can which means you're gonna take a little extra care in handling it because the thinner plasters are not going to respond as well to accidental banging. No, that's true. No, I would still I would still put some layers of burlap, some scrim in the back as well, uh, just a couple yeah. of layers. But the overall thickness of it is much thinner than you know a solid mass. So if you can dry it out or let it dry, and also I let it. I don't dry it with a hairdryer. I, I let it dry overnight. I yeah, I, dry. I sometimes will put a just a little little oscillating fan on it. I've got a couple of fans in the shop to circulate air, and that'll help dry it out pretty quick, too. Or if you've got a heating vent, you can set it in front of. Now that it's cold outside, you can put it, put it by a, a little heat vent, and that'll dry it out in short order. So that'll, 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 uh, that'll do the thing. But I was just curious about, um, about using that, because I've never tried it. So I'm going to try. So thank you, Rick Connolly, for that uh, suggestion. It's a fantastic Rick's, idea. Rick's got some good ideas. Yeah, well, it's, all, it's just one of those things where this is what I like when people suggest things. I'm like, huh, I've never done that. Let me try. And then, you know, we can talk about it. And it's a fucking great discussion point. And so, yeah, very cool. I see this Elmer's glue is saying like, oh, we can use it for making slime and all this kind yep. of stuff. So I know there's a whole slime movement, which I'm not <laughs> part of. <laughs> Got to get on board the slime train, Stuart. That's a, the slime movement. <laughs> Again, that's back to Arg with his all-meat diet, I think. And the other email question we had, which was really good, was from Suzanne Lee. And she emailed with the question was, Hey there, I'm looking to make a ball cap to go under a receding alopecia look wig. I read your article in the Prosthetics magazine about the hybrid ball cap. I was just wondering if you can use super baldies with the latex instead of baldies, as I would rather blend the edges with alcohol instead of acetone if possible. Thanks for sharing knowledge, blah, blah, blah. Uh, thank you very much, Susie. Well, I mean, I actually messaged her back with an audio message. I've started doing this more when people have emailed questions in. I'll actually just record a message because it's much quicker mm. than typing. <laughs> and also, um, you know, I save them so I can scan back through them. But I don't know if you saw my message. But basically, um, for anyone that's not heard of this hybrid ball cap it's not my idea as far as i'm aware it's neil gorton's idea i think he came up with it and we did an article about it in the magazine a couple of years ago uh, but basically uh, obviously ball caps can be made out of latex or ball cap plastic and ball cap plastic is great obviously that's why it's called ball cap plastic um but often with heat it can stretch especially if there's a lot of hair underneath mm-hmm. that can slip and it can distort. So it goes on nice and tight at the start of the day, but over the course of the day as it heats up, it softens and stretches out. So you could use instead latex caps, which is great, but some people are allergic to latex. And also you can't really blend a latex edge very well, although the Ed French video shows a very good way of doing it, but 
I digress. Um, so Neil had this idea of doing like a couple of layers of cat plastic on a head form and then keeping back from the edge, you stipple a few layers of latex. And then when that's dry, you s- spray more cat plastic over the top. So it's basically sealed. And then that way you get the best of both worlds. So you could totally do it. And I've suggested, yeah, you could do that where you basically use IPA cat plastic instead of, you know, a- alcohol cat plastic mm-hmm. instead of acetone. But I'm, I'm not structurally, I find, see what's good about alcohol cat plastic for pieces is it's much softer, which makes it really shit for ball caps, I think. So I would suggest doing the bulk of it with um, an, al- an acetone cat plastic and then doing the latex inside. But I was saying what you could do is just the front inch or two is the bit right. that you need to blend. So that could be alcohol cat plastic. You know, so you just keep back from there and just do the rest of that with alcohol. But the bulk of it, the stuff that's under the wig, the stuff that you don't see that's under costume, that could all be uh, acetone cat plastic or latex. But just the front couple of inches that you need to blend with alcohol, that could be yeah. alcohol. So you can combine them all because they'll, they'll bond it's to like, each other. It's like wigs um, that because are they go on made as liquid. with different types of lace where, you know, the, the hairline is, is real fine movie lace that you can't see it once it's it's glued down. But the bulk of the wig cap on top of the head is is much heavier lace mm. yeah the nice thing about it is that they yeah, all same principle you know, isn't it the latex yeah. and the acetone cap plastic and the alcohol cap plastic they all they will all stick to each other so mm-hmm. you know figure out what you need how you how, you, how to put it together and use use whichever of the three or all three you need to, to achieve yeah. your purpose. Yeah. I think, I think doing that would work well. I mean, you just, just do the edges, you know, the, 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 the inch around the edge as, as the alcohol cap plastic and the red, the rest of it can be brushed on acetone cap plastic just with a paintbrush sure. and it'll be much thicker than you need, but that's where you get that strength from and you know, making it thicker on the crown or using the latex over the top of that. But I have to check out the magazine for that. Cause it needed pictures to do that, but I might do a video of it as well. Um, uh, and I did, I did shoot despite the protestations <laughs> from the other guy. I have actually shot video for that makeup, not because he said, but because we shot it when we were making it. It takes a while to edit video. Yes, especially it does. You're full time working. A bunch of stuff's going on. So I have shot video and I will edit it. Um, it's just going to take me, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do it over Christmas because it'll be much quieter, but, um, I'm editing a video for, I don't know if you remember, there was a Cyclops video, uh, um, that a girl called Helen sculpted, Helen McKenna, and she sculpted this really cool Cyclops on a, a, a Don Lanning sculpting class. And she kept the whole thing damp and wrapped up and kept it safe for months and wanted to mold it. And uh, she got in touch. I was like, oh, yeah, we could totally mold it. And we did it over a few days. But I said, do you mind if I video the process? Because I've not, at the time, I wanted to use a whole bunch of new stuff I had not tried before uh, for epoxy. So I bought a, a load of Smooth On stuff to try out. And, uh, and we did it in... Um, Mm-hmm. epoxy coat yeah did you use the gray coat? yes the gray yeah. um and then we used freeform sculpt to sort of take out the big kind of undercuts yeah and then um and then uh i think we used freeform sculpt on the edge and then bulked it out in some big areas with freeform air and then glassed over Very the whole light. thing yeah, glassed over the whole thing with uh, with the epoxy and, and glass matting. And I just tried a few different epoxy things out on the same head. Um, so it was a bit of an experiment and a chance for me to try a di- few different things and video it all. So I started editing that today, so that was fun to do. So, so I take it that it turned out pretty well? Oh, it came out really well. Yeah, I was really pleased with it. And it's one of those things, because you were the first person I'd ever seen using Freeform Air. And it's fucking great. I mean, it is great not... stuff. They have a they have a, a high temperature version of it mm-hmm. that um, you know one of the components stinks to high heaven. I'm not sure exactly what's in it, um, but I've had no problems with the regular freeform air just because you know when I'm baking foam latex and I'm doing pretty much all of my molds out of epoxy now for foam latex. I'm not cooking it hot enough that it seems to be doing anything detrimental to the epoxy. So mm-hmm. I've had great results just using the regular freeform air mm. uh, 
in heat applications. Yeah. The only thing I would say with the freeform air is I think it's like, depending on how you open your molds, if you use a lot of leverage from a screwdriver, for example, you might sort of exert a lot of pressure on a single point, which might sink into, which is why around the edges on this, I did the freeform sculpt. That's a good idea, yeah. Cause first. As, as strong as the freeform air is, if you it you can gouge into it pretty pretty easily mm. with with something and I've 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 done that accidentally with a couple of things getting trying to lever something out didn't mm. damage the mold but it just puts a little cosmetic ding in it that too many of those and then then you have some problems yeah well I think if you you know if you know where you're going to open your molds you just make sure that they're a little tougher behind that first mm -hmm. um, but it's great for those large areas where you need to bulk it out but you don't need the weight but it's i mean i have done molds that are easier to open with it or you know you just use care you you know use wooden wedges instead of a screwdriver to pop it open and that seems to work just fine but for the ease of use and the light you know the weight of it is amazing because if you've got a bunch of those on a shelf you know it doesn't doesn't kill you if, it, if they fall down kind of thing. Yeah, I think we've talked about it before, but I uh, might mention it again here now. Um, if you're doing a, a stone mold for a, a slush cast mask, for example, you're doing a, a rubber mask to do the whole thing out of UltraCal, you wind up having a pretty heavy, heavy mold. And if you're trying to slosh rubber around and manhandle this thing by yourself, it can can be quite a task. What I've found is I'll, I'll do my detail layer of UltraCal and then once that's gone off and started to cool down, I'll back it with, you know, a half inch to three quarters of an inch of freeform air and it will bond just fine to the UltraCal and then you've got a nice strong lightweight mold mm -hmm. for doing slush casting that's real easy to would you recommend doing and i guess you would but would you recommend getting that freeform air on as soon as possible as soon as the plaster's set up because obviously it would stick a little better if it was slightly damper and let it dry out or had you left it a week before doing it would it still bond yeah but i've 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 done it i've done it both ways and and it it seems to work fine uh you know one thing you might want to try to do is after you get your detail layer on is do do a thin another layer with mm -hmm. uh, some burlap mm -hmm. pieces in it. And then the freeform air can, can also, if it, so you don't have to be real careful about completely immersing the burlap yeah. in the ultra cal. You can have some, some bits sticking out. And then that also gives the freeform air something to grab on else to grab onto. Mm. I mean, what is good about the freeform air and all those epoxies is they mix okay with water. So, yeah, you know, you could you could even sort of have a you know wet hands or a little bowl of water on that and make a kind of a slip with it and kind mm -hmm. of wipe it in there. Do you know what I mean? To kind of blend, and then in the moisture would kind of soak into the plaster and yeah. take some I, of the epoxy. I also with it. use uh, denatured alcohol. Yes, we did that when you were making the ear molds. Yeah, yeah, that's not something I'd seen before, and that worked quite well. It works really um, well. Yeah. Now I looked at uh, a few tutorials just to see, because it had been a while since I'd done this video and I was trying to think, shit, where was, did I use this freeform air or the sculpt on it first? And I looked through the video and I saw what was stiffer looking than the air. And I said, oh yeah, I must've done the, the sculpt first. So I looked up a freeform sculpt tutorial and I found this, um, it's a lady that, that I've seen her website before and she's, uh, her, um, Christ, oh my God, I can't speak. It's a long day. Her YouTube <laughs> channel. Fucking hell. And, does uh, does her YouTube channel actually have video on it? It does have video, definitely, yes. Um, but I moaned at her for it not being uh, 4K because, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm used to. Um, <laughs> no, it was uh, – it was uh, – she done uh, some sculpting. So she does all kinds of different sculpts. She's done a paper mache book. And she got a channel um, doing all this different type of paper mache stuff. And she'd done something in uh, freeform sculpt. So she made the armature in tin foil and then made all these little um, blobs of um, the freeform sculpt and sculpted this whole like duck thing over the top. It's fucking brilliant. It was really, really cool. Well, I and actually sculpted, you know, put up, the, put up the link to her, to her page. I'd love to see that. Let me find that link. I'll just do that now. Uh, freeform sculpt link. There we go. So we'll have a look at that. Cool. So today's guest. One of my favorite people. 
Yeah, he's such a nice guy. He's Matthew Mungle. And uh, you should know who Matthew Mungle is. Um, if you don't, he's, he's won Academy Award uh, with Dracula, uh, for Dracula with Greg Cannon and Michelle mm-hmm. Bowe. He's, he's had three nominations, though. Um, but he won an Oscar in, or an Academy Award in 93. He's had a bunch of primetime Emmy wins and lots of nominations. BAFTA and nomination for Dracula. And he's developed some terrific products. Yes, the Fangoria Chainsaw Award nominee. Now that, that's a pretty cool one. <laughs> you can keep your Academy Award at the, 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 the Fangoria Chainsaw Award. Yeah, no, he's, he, he comes up with a lot of materials, you know, and, and the different stipples and the sealers and the, and the pallets he's got and all kinds of stuff. So Yeah, I've been uh, using his stuff for a long time. Yeah, so WM Creations, if you're not familiar with that. I'll put some links on there for, for that stuff too. Um, but yeah, we, we, uh, we had a really good old chat. A little little tour of his workshop and then we sat down and chatted about stuff and what i didn't want to do was just talk about the things he'd done because i figured like you know like people like rick baker as well they they get those questions all the time and so you'll find the the same answers lots of different places so i wanted to focus more on things like when you get a script what happens how does it get broken how does that how do those words get turned into a series of tasks for a workshop and what's the difference between something like csi or a tv show that you've done you know or a movie and what's the difference and how does it feel to do that? So that's what we kind of focused on. He's, he's one of the most generous people I've ever met. Um, he's got, oh, yeah. He, he, I asked him if he would be interested in doing a tutorial for the third edition of my book. And he said, sure, that sounds great. And I got four. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Just over deliver and, and, yeah, and, he's, and be he's nice just, about it. He's just a great, great guy. Amazing. Yeah, no, I had a great time chatting to him. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, get your ears around this. Enjoy this interview with Matthew Mungle, and uh, we'll be back after that. Woohoo! I'm in, I'm in heaven now. That's amazing. <laughs> so you live near Austin as well? No, I live eight minutes from here. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, nice. Just right down the street. So you don't have far to commute? No. Awesome. No yeah. traffic jam and for you? I, no traffic jam <laughs> for me. And I, you know, I have my little workshop here. I'm... I'm my little own Geppetto with all my little tinkers and baubles and whatever I need to do, you know? Yeah. That makes me happy because all my career I spent uh, uh, doing makeups, creating makeups on my own, and then transitioning to a full working lab with all these people to, to guide and uh, gave me no time for myself to create, and now I I got that back, mm-hmm. and it's it's a world of difference in my life. You know? I'll bet. Yeah. that's the thing that when you start out doing stuff, you know, you this is what I've always kind of struggled with. I've never run like at my own big workshop with staff. I've always been lucky. A pair of hats. <laughs> <laughs> lucky you are. I suppose. Yeah, but it puts a cap on what you can earn because as soon as you can start, that you know, controlling other people. Exactly, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, because to make money and to do what you enjoy to do and make good money, you have to open a lab on your own mm. and own your own business at the same time. You're going to work harder than you've ever worked on any job, running the lab, keeping it together because it is your baby. And you want to make sure to nurture that and make it a full company. Yeah. So you're going to work more, you're going to work harder than you ever worked. However, the gratification of it is a hundred percent more than working for somebody else. Because you're working on your own. Obviously, you're pleasing directors, producers, actors, and stuff like that. But you don't have to be the middleman, you know, mm. or the grunt, mm-hmm. so to speak. But you've got to pair of teeth as well, though, because you've got to keep people in line, haven't you? And any, any group of people, there's going to be people that are pulling their weight and some that just aren't. And you've got to trim mm. the fat off sometimes. You, you do. Know, and you do. That's not a comfortable thing. And a lot of people don't like doing that. No. being fierce but you've got to be active you're going to protect yeah. everything else I think early in my career I was 
obsessed with doing everything the way I had learned, the way I kept on learning, the meticulous, meticulous that I am uh, with everything, the detail, cleaning the edges before I made a mold, overseeing the prosthetics I would make, doing it on my own. And I had to re-educate myself when I opened my own lab because there were other people I had to rely on mm -hmm. because we would get so many jobs, I would have to delegate. And I learned how to delegate. I learned how to let things go, but still keep an eye on it. That once it was done, the quality was per my perception of what it should be leaving the door right but you don't have to micromanage every step because you no. can't because if you've got 10 makeups happening at once there's 50 steps happening at the same time you can't watch every one you have to trust the stuff you have. exactly and you have to rely on the artist you have hired yeah and that must be very hard if you come from being personally responsible for every inch of everything you've done because now you want Forgive the expression, you need more inches. <laughs> no. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, it's true because but, you you have to let go. Yeah. You know, and it was really hard for me to let go at, yeah. at the beginning. But I, you know, after talking to my partner, John, and and, and starting the business and, and us helping each other, you know, because he was an accountant first and then he wanted to, I started teaching him how to do makeup and that worked out for both of us because he oversaw the money aspects of the business and pulling in jobs was my responsibility. So it, it just became a good working relationship. And yeah, you have to let things go sometimes. Not the quality of it, but just let the artist do their work too and trust in people. Yeah, you can't personally be responsible for, for every little thing. And Absolutely. once you do start micromanaging, it doesn't work. Yes, I've seen that happen. I've seen that a number. And so I'm sure you have. Out. Yeah, and it's just, it I'm just sure slows everything down and everything becomes very resentful. Right. It doesn't blossom and flourish in its own account. Exactly. Which it should do. And, and I learned so much about getting along with people and listening to their needs but at the same time, interjecting my needs of what the company needs. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just running a company, you know, and not, and the, I think the most important, one of the most important things that I learned is it's, it's not advantageous for you as a business owner and a boss to demean anyone in life or in it, it, now, if you have to reprimand somebody, you take them aside into another room and you talk. You don't do it in front of other people because that makes you look bad. That makes them feel bad. So it's a matter of working with people, you know, and in a long term, too. Yeah. You know? So That's important. You have to learn, I guess, on the job. You have to learn. And life, you know, as you grow up, you learn. Yeah. Well... It just, it's a constant fight, but a good battle, you know, to have. That's a great quote. I like that. That's a good one. <laughs> Ask me to repeat it, and I would completely <laughs> forget what I said. <laughs> we'll probably put it in the top. Okay, that's so, fine with me. Just go back and listen to it. <laughs> and I want to talk a little bit about the the work that goes into how would, how when a job comes in, how it gets from being words on a page to something that people are filming. Because there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on that isn't about getting your hands dirty and moving clay around, but it does require you to understand those processes in order to be able to break down a script. So could we go through a little bit about what that involves and how what the process is of, of taking words on a page and thrashing it out to a series of jobs that will get broken down to you know, benches and people with clay? I was lucky in that, and I positioned myself to do this. When I started my career, I wanted to go out on my own and do my own thing. I didn't want to work for somebody. I wanted to do my own thing. Of course, there was a lot of stumbles, a lot of failure, 
uh, a lot of a lot of successes, you know, learning my craft. And to learn that, I worked for nothing sometimes, starting out, just to get the experience of working with other people. And it was so advantageous for me to do that, looking back, because it gave me a sense of pride in my work and also uh, working with other people and directors, producers, actors. And, and, and I learned the craft that way before I went and worked for Mike McCracken Sr. or Tom Berman or, uh, you know, whoever I worked for, you know. Um, it, they knew immediately when they hired me and I started working there, this kid knows what he's doing because he's, he just knows what he's doing now, you know, because, and I contributed to that I started out the way I started out. You know, so breaking down a script and everything, I'll um, I'll go for the pro, uh, perspective of a television show, let's say, okay. first, and then we'll go on to a movie. But a television show, I equate a television season to a train that leaves the station on the first episode, the first whatever. And it doesn't stop until you finish the 24th episode or the 12th episode. And you cannot, sure, you're going to have little stops along the way for hiatus and stuff, but you can't stop that train because it's a constant moving show Mm -hmm. that is week to week to week. Whether you have seven days to do an episode or eight days to do an episode, you're still on that train and you've got to keep up with the work. Right? So... For instance, uh, CSI and NCI and NCIS and um, and X Files were all three different shows that we worked on that were constant shows. Once the once it started out, you had to keep on top of it. And uh, CSI and NCIS, we were working on both at the same time. So we had two shows plus other medical shows that would come through, uh, series that would come through the whole time. So to to do an episode like that, they each had their little quirks, each had their different producers, their way of doing things. But in the long run, the overall view was I'd get the script, I'd read it once, maybe twice to break it down if it wasn't clear in my mind. Once I'd done that... I would have a makeup meeting with the producers, the director, whoever wanted to be involved, the costume designer, and go over the points that we needed in that script. Now, I'm a very thorough, sometimes over thorough makeup artist, makeup effect artist, and I love to hit the points that maybe they haven't thought of. Is this going to be visual effects? Uh, can we show that much blood? Can we show a person being shot that way or killed that way? If we can't, and I know, and I'm looking at the director going, and he says, yes, I want it to be this way, this way. But then I'll turn my my look to the producers and say, will CBS or whoever let us get away with that? Yeah. And are we just spinning our wheels and spending a half day shooting this where it can't be used? Yeah. Or use a second of it? Why should I go through the, the motion of it? Mm-hmm. But being nice to the producer, director, giving the director what he wants within limits, it's a give-and-take relationship when you enter a, a, a television series like this. So we'll go over the script. Each point of makeup I'll have designed. Uh, I'll have the earmarked, dog-eared the page, highlighted the page, uh, later on, if we didn't get the script, we'd get it in digital form. You can highlight it in um, I annotate and all that stuff. I'm sure there's programs for that that you can go through. And what's the next one? What's the next one? We'll go through each point, how to figure out how to do that. How are we going to shoot that? The DP will be there at the same time. How are we going to shoot that? Are we going to shoot it in uh, real time and then you're going to reverse it or 
you going to slow this action down? How are, how are we going to shoot that? And what are the camera angles? What do I need to prep for it? Because everybody's on a time limit, and it's usually about five days before you shoot, maybe four days. CSI, it was all about the autopsies. First the crime scene, and then the autopsies, how this person was killed. Are we going to use a fake body? Are we going to use a real person? Or are we going to use a combination of the two? And so we would figure that out. And then once that was done, we figured all these little minutia points of, of that. I would go back to the lab. I'd sit down with my crew. We'd go over every step of what I just pulled from that meeting. You know, let's, And then I would brainstorm it with my guys, too. Obviously, I would have my sense of how to do it. And I learned way early in my career to uh, believe in my instincts and go with my first gut feeling about something. Of course, that changes a little bit. But when you get um, the history and the know-how of doing things, and you've done it over and over, and you failed, and then you've gone up on top and and completed that effect because you failed, you learn things. Yeah. And then after a little while, you you learn to trust your instincts about it. Now, I always relied on that. And I saw working and having a full working lab, it was great because I could stand back from what my artists were doing and walk in and say, uh, this needs to be this way. Can we change this a little bit? Because you have a different perspective of walking in on a sculpture than you do when you're working on it. Yes. Because you're right there. Yes. And I always told, no matter how good the sculpture was, I told him, you know, work for 15 minutes and then just turn around and... I don't know, make a phone call or write something down and turn back around to your sculpture and look at it. Get a new per- perspective of it. Because I was always I learned to trust my instincts and also look over what was going on and get a new perspective that they didn't have because they're working so close with it. As I am I am guilty of also. You know, because once you start working on something and you're so tied up in it, you're not seeing the big picture. You're just seeing that little wrinkle or something, and it doesn't work with it mm-hmm. in the big picture. So I'll go back, sit with my crew. We'll go over everything that we're going to do and what molds we're going to use because we would have a male and a female mold, uh, sometimes two of each. And uh, if it was a fake body, we would at- make sure that they cast that actor first, and I would talk about that in the meeting that we had with the producers, directors, the ADs, the DP that was there. And I'd say, look over to the ADs, when can you get it cast? You know, I need that as soon as possible. We were all um, in tune with each other uh, by the end, or even even the second or third season. Because yeah. it was a well-oiled machine, and they would be smart enough to hire the same people back. You know, and once you do that and you get it's a family and you pick on pick out each other's little quirks and 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 what you're going with. And sometimes the meetings would go just flawlessly because it would be directors that were constantly coming back and you get in the rhythm with them. Yeah. And it's such a great feeling to do that, you know, but um Going back to the bodies, if it was a body and we'd have to make a full silicone body, then we'd make sure that the ADs got that guy cast as soon as possible. Most of the time, it was just an extra that was di- died and then comes back and would do the sure. autopsy. Oh, we need, need, that, we need that head soon. cast as yeah. soon as possible. Because it seems to me there's a lot of little things like just the, the production appreciating the process is requiring lead times. Right. You know, if you have to keep repeating yourself over and over, like in, sometimes on films, it's all new to that particular right. person. Whereas with a show like that, you say it's a family grad, you learn right. you know, the, the friction and the 
you know, no, the, the sticking exactly. points between different departments and gradually you can work that out. Exactly. And then it can, like you say, become this beautiful world yeah. of machines. And, and sometimes when I walk on to a television show and they're not familiar with me and my work and stuff, and it's like, you know, and, and, and they're looking at me, why are you asking me all these questions? Because... You, you're going to come back and blame me at the end. I'm not going to say this to them, but you're going to come back and blame me. Why didn't you ask that question? Well, I over ask questions, you know, yeah. and, and to nitpick about what this is going to be because this is my profession. This is your profession. Let's make it work. It's going to be advantageous for all of us if it works. Mm-hmm. So going back to the bodies, the silicone body, if we had to make an autopsy body, then with, uh, you know, part of my crew would start on making the body because uh, we'd make a new body every time. We'd try to, to reuse some of the bodies. Some of the bodies we could. Some of them, you know, most of the time we couldn't. If it was a burnt body, we could use the same body and just distress it or whatever we needed to do. Uh, and then an actor would come in. We'd take a full head cast of him with a mouth open, whatever the, the director or the producers wanted. It would be poured up in tin silicone at the time because it was fast. It was kicked fast. We could get a head out and paint it in a day, you know, because it was directly in the silicone cast. Clean it up, go cut any imperfections in, clean it up, do all the damage to the head that we needed to do, and then give the hair puncher enough time to do the hair. Because if the hair isn't right and punched correctly, it looks shitty. You know, if it has to have a beard growth, punch the beard in long and then we'll, we'll shave it to whatever the actor is on that day, you know. But again, five days to do that. So it's a grudge, grudgy, you know, every day. And having started out by myself in, in low-budget films and working 24-7 and stuff, I promised myself early in my career I would never do that when I... Uh, uh, had a shop. So we would work from 7 to 4 every day or if I had to in the morning and I saw it was going to go late in the morning when they came in, guys, I think we need to work in a couple extra days today to get this hours today to get this finished. And, you know, it was all agreeable like that, but we never did work more than a 10 hour day. We would try not to and working overnight to get something done. Just focus on your work in the morning, take a break in the afternoon, get it done for me, and I will be, I was always loyal to my employees in that if it was a slow time, I'd still keep them on because um, I got a lot of flack from that from other people in the industry because, you know, in our industry, you hire the artists that you need at the time. But I found that if you hire people, and nurture their talent and their strength and their weaknesses and be loyal to them, they'll be loyal to you back. It's like a bee with honey. Yeah. Here we go. You know. And sure, you take a cut in pay or hours, not a cut in uh, hourly, but a cut in your hours during the week if something wasn't happening. But I'm going to keep you employed. Boost, right? yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. a lot of people, and a lot of people were kind of, sorry, stupid, and wanted to go on to the next job and then someplace else. And later on in the years, they'd call me back and say, you know what, I didn't realize how good I had it. I said, you know, you're loyal to me, I'm loyal to you. You know. So I think just treating a, another human being like a human being instead of a, you know, you're just working for me. Mm-hmm. And I was always, you're working with me, not for me. We're working in this together. It's an art. We need to have fun with it, you know. So, going back to the body again. Sorry, I digress. Uh, Hair's punched. We get it back. We make sure that before it goes out, we know how we're going to tie the head onto the body. We make sure it's the same silicone formula, color, everything. The body was hollowed out. The chest was put in. We pre-make a lot of molds for autopsy bodies just so we'd have them. Because I, I foresaw us being on CSI for a long time, and we were. We were for 11 years, we would do it over and over again. Really so, oh my gosh. <laughs> I came on the fifth season, and we ended on the 
I think 16th season or something. Wow. 14, 15th or 16th. So if you stayed that long, you must have done something right. I was doing something right. <laughs> but good. always on my toes. Never letting it be uh, a given that this is going to happen. Yeah. Always trying to make it better, you know. And if I found myself letting down things or letting myself down, I'd have to renew myself or just let the job go, you know, because I just, I, I wanted to give 150% and not 50%, you know. So once, once we got the head back, it's all punched, beautiful, cover that up with plastic, graft it onto the body, you know, punch hair in the arms if we needed to, if we had time or whatever, and uh, it goes off to the set. So you're talking about directly having as best seam as you can, but then seaming it, filling that seam. Seaming it. Texturing. So together. Apply that's right. To get a flawless finish. A flawless finish. Wow. Yeah. But that's great, though, because you yeah. have to figure out how making molds fit together in it's advance. Fit. Because Absolutely. for a thing, it's pointless. Exactly. And what, where do you where do you do the, the bond? Do you do it further up the neck? Do you do it... Uh, do do a flap that goes down further. You know, it's all technique. It's yes, because on the neck, it's, a, it's less seam line, but it's in a really critical place. And the circumference. And the circumference, yeah. I, 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 yeah. You know. So it just depends on what the body needed at yeah. the time. Yeah. You know, and what... I was, I was always excited to get a new script, whether it be X-Files, a, a, a medical show, or CSI or NCIS. What, what are they going to come up with next that... How are we going to kill somebody? <laughs> what creature do we have to make? You know, I was always just so enamored with the writers as far as that. And working with the writers, because the writers would call us every once in a while, can we do this? And it's like, I was sure. going to ask about that. Do they, did you ever feel like they just went off on one, or did they ever come back to say, oh, you know, you could do this really well very quickly? Maybe, can we do, do you know what I mean? Actually incorporate the things that can be done quickly, reasonably, or well physically and building that in rather than I mean I've worked on shows where they write stuff and it's easy to write the words but it's like it's a hell of an expensive thing if only you said you know it wasn't floating or you know right. it, it wasn't running up the walls right. then it would have been you know a third of the price you know what I mean exactly. and, 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 exactly. and words like um, Morrissey might say words so easily thrown or whatever is it just no, heavy words so easily thrown it's like you know it's just it's easy to say that but that's expensive that's right so Stuart. it's good if they can so so true Stuart so, so true I would have writers occasionally call me or call me into their offices, and and we discuss a scene about certain things. Um, uh, it was it was kind of rare, but it would still be if I did get a script, and the writers would be there in the meeting, my makeup meeting about how they need to change it. We would go over it, and well, anatomically that doesn't happen that way. It happens this way. Oh, okay, we'll change that. You know, they were very amenable to that always changing things on a script like that. And I think we all had our give and takes on things. The worst thing you can do as an artist is be regimented with everything you do. Remember, this is an art, not a science. Art is flowing constantly, you know, give and take. You know, oh, I can't do it this way. Okay, I'll do it that way. Well, that doesn't work. We'll do it this way, you know. It's always thinking up new ways of doing things. I think you, that's quite difficult when people are starting out because they, oh. especially if they learn nowadays, different ways of learning. And I know you're probably <laughs> on so this. And we will come back to the film thing because we need to say we talked about TV script breakdown. I do want to yeah, yeah. go back to the film script. Okay. But the danger, I think, with some education is people learn to do things a certain way mm -hmm. and that just becomes canon to them rather than being taught how to think, they're taught specific processes. Because I guess, in a way, from a, an education point of view, it's a scalable thing to say, do this this way, because that's how I was shown, and that's the only way I know, and I only graduated from college myself last year, or whatever, to, you could do it this way, you could do it that way. Ultimately, there are different ways of doing this, and the end is this, yeah. and I'm going to show you one or two ways you could do that, but yeah. be aware you should be thinking about how else you could do it. Right. So you sort of, you're, you're sort of, let out from the nest with a compass rather than a map. So do you know what I mean? So you don't have to have exactly. a specific route if you take a wrong turn. I'm screwed. It didn't work. You know. Um, and obviously you, I noticed how you work. You're very 
again, flowing with it. You're reacting whatever's happening in the moment with this, right. with that. That's not the thing. He's allergic to this, or that's the wrong color, or whatever. There's always a, you know, a, 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 an element of detached joy. You know, you you're trying to, to bounce around. A you bit. have to. Yeah. And if you don't enjoy doing makeup or prosthetics or anything, then maybe it's not for you. Yeah. You know. You but have it's to enjoy people to think that. That's the, that's my worry. People see yeah. so, see shows like Face Up or something. Go, well, I want to make oh pictures, gosh. and it's all yeah. you know. It's fun to make those things, but they're not. No. They're not taught the right way to think necessarily. And it is it is about you know coming up against you know an actor that doesn't like you because he hates being covered in rubber or he didn't realize he was going to die in this episode and now he's not in the season anymore or mm-hmm. all these other things. Well, which, you know, it's dealing and, with those and, things. And it's always you can come up with the best design ever made mm. but if you can't work with the actor and the actor doesn't want to wear it that way and the director doesn't like it and the producer is is likes it but the other producer doesn't it's like you have all of these points against you so you have to be amenable to change and manipulate what you're working with but not manipulate other people to it, it, it's a delicate balance, mm. you know. It's a dance. It's a dance, and a lot of people can't dance, you know. And you have to. That doesn't come overnight. It, it's something you learn. Yeah. Over your profession. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you can learn how to run silicon or make a cutting edge or sculpt a nose, but just that alone isn't the same no. like an analogy I would use is like you know I know how to make a sandwich but I can't take on Subway right and right. beat them because there's more to Subway than just how a sandwich is made right right it's not once you've got that golden information of slicing bread and putting filling in it right now you are the same with Subway right but right, I think right. that is the perception a lot of people if they learn the techniques or they learn the tips I hate that yeah can I know throw me some tricks or some tips it's like you can you know <laughs> amass enough own. tricks to somehow become good at something and it's like no you're gonna love it and and you know sometimes you're down for a long time yeah you know but you still nourished by it you you have to keep your ears out for the newest uh products out there you have to learn from other people and not be closed off that this is the way i'm going to do it you know there are so many ways of doing things and learning from other people how they do it you know I, I just met you last week, and I've learned so much from you really? by doing things. Yes, absolutely. Because oh, cool. there's just little quirks that we all have about doing things and, and, you know, with plastic skins and things like this. And, you know, it, it's, just, it's just, you never stop learning. If you stop learning, you might as well just die or give up everything. Because that's what life's about, is constantly learning about new things. And it keeps the creative juices flowing. Well, likewise, man. It was, it was like that when we were doing that class. We did little burn makeup, and it was just like, you know, I'm nervous as hell. Do it. It. You're doing a class in front, you're doing a demo in front of a group of people. That and we just met. Itself, we just met. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm doing a makeup with Matthew Mungo now. Okay, let's try and screw it up. But oh. actually, what happens is I forget the class is there, and I forget that we hadn't met before. And I'll, I'm just watching what you're doing and, and just picking and up on it. And I'm you know, feeding off of that. And then, oh, okay, we're going to make this much darker. And now i sort of bend here and break it up. And it becomes like, like a dance, like you say. And it's that kind of thing. But the thing I got from it was it was joyful. It was fun. fun. It was nice. And it was a good thing to do. And I came away feeling like I'd learned more than, you know, had I just, you know, felt like I was going to execute how I'm sure to do a bug or whatever. I know, so, yeah. because it's different every time. I mean, you can you can start executing the way you want, but as you're getting into it, you have to be able to flow and change with the material and the way it's setting up and the way the paint is taking to the to the silicone or whatever medium you're working in, and you have to be fluid. Yeah. And when it goes wrong, so important. You know, you sometimes, sometimes the worst mistakes come out being the best things. Yes, yeah. yeah. You know, I know you've had to add that happen to you. I have oh, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, where am I going? Sometimes I get through a makeup, and right in the middle of a makeup, I go, "What the heck am I going with this makeup?" I, it's like, what am I supposed to do? And then all at once, it just—it's like all these molecules out there in the universe 
floating around and all at once they just come together and it yeah. congeal. Yeah. And it's like that is the best feeling I could ever have. I, mean, I get goosebumps when, we, yeah. when I talk about that because it's 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 the best feeling. It's an analogy that a lot of people have used. It's like you're Frankenstein and you're making a monster. And yeah. It's all pulling together. It is. And it comes and in that moment it's like you have to remember that bit because when when you're when you're in the act of creating or you're in that flow state where everything's mm-hmm, kind of working mm-hmm. or not so maybe maybe things are all mm-hmm. in the air and it's not coming together yet mm-hmm. it's, it's becoming comfortable with that feeling mm-hmm. because you know this creative feeling is what it's like that's right rather than thinking it's not finished yet so it's wrong and therefore i hate myself that's it's right like, it's very easy to do the, the whole point is it's an act of faith oh yeah to to, to live with that feeling of uncertainty but still working. Absolutely. Knowing it's going to come together. Knowing it's going to come together. Knowing it's going to come hooping, together. Yeah. Knowing. Yeah. You know, in the same way, if you start up your car, you expect it to work. If you put the brake, right. the brake should work. You have to know it's in order to function. It's possible some things can go wrong, but you can't think like that. Otherwise no, you can't. You can't go anywhere or do anything. No, you can't. Um, Not at all. I mean, there, and there, you know, going to another point is there are times that, you know, you, you do a makeup over and over and over again. On Bram Stoker's Dracula, we had to put Gary's makeup on like maybe 20 times or something. I can't remember now. Long time ago. Long time ago. Galaxy far away. Uh, but there was one time that I put the makeup on. We started in the morning. And I put the makeup on. And I turned around and it was finished. And I had no idea that I that it, I, we had even done that. Because it was just like clockwork. It was like... Uh, a, a sense it, uh, you're on automatic. What's that muscle memory? A muscle just, memory. Yeah. And you just do it because you know where every freckle goes, where every vein goes, where every piece goes, and how it lays over. And it was the most amazing feeling I've ever had. Yes. Is a uh, makeup like that. But again, that's basically down to repetition and practice, which is yes, how it is. We can all feel about yes, it anything. We, the most complex makeup. It's yeah. like it's just a case of doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and getting uh, proficient. You, you, there are so many how-to makeup uh, things out there. You know how how to do a makeup this way and this way. People look at it, and I think they have me- muscle memory. They think they have, and they oh, I can do that. And then once you get into it, it's difficult, isn't it? Mm. There is a finesse you need. You know, the, about the description how well. you handle a piece, yeah. how you put a piece down, how it lays down, how you get the edge to just disappear into the skin, yeah. how you, you know, how you deal with the bad edge, how you deal with, you know, is the position right? Is the nose on correctly? Is it too high? Is it too low? You know, yeah. you can't rush through these things, but at the same time, you have to because that actor has to get on the... Uh, the, the set and do his work. Yes. I, I, I never wanted to do a makeup that was over three and a half hours because I knew that once I finished my job, that was my job finished, the actor has to go out there and actually portray that character. So why keep him in the seat longer than he has to? You can do touch-ups on the set, you know. You can do, and now digitally they, they say they... Put, touch it up, but who knows? You know, so you have to do your 150 percent to get that makeup done. But to hold an actor in hostage in a chair longer than he should because you don't know what you're doing or you want to, you know, make it absolutely perfect is beyond me. Because they have to do their job after you do your job, you know, and be in that makeup for 12 hours. So come on. Be a little nicer to all of us, you know. And ADs, you know, the bane of our existence sometimes. PAs, the worst sometimes, as nice as they can be. Knocking on the door. Sometimes I will pull them aside before I start the makeup and I say, I need 45 minutes to do this makeup. Please do not come and knock on the door or would you please come to me in 45 minutes and knock on the door and say uh, it's time or something we have a, a, a system with us you know and if I know I'm running behind I'll tell you but don't come in before that is he ready Badger is he ready yeah, is he yeah. ready is he ready they need him on set first you know obviously there are those emergencies and I understand that but give me my time you know just give me my time 
And I was one for, I started learning time really good in the early part of my career about they need the actor in there. And if you say 30 minutes, it's, it's not going to be an hour and a half. It's going to be 30 minutes. You know, be true to your word, you mm-hmm. know. And the producers will look at that. The directors will know that. And you get hired again. If you're, if you're true to your word and also putting out a budget. Don't go back to him and say, oh, I miscalculated, I need some more money. You think that budget through before you give it to him, you know. And that's going to go over more than your work sometimes is your loyalty to production as far as your budgets are concerned, as far as your time is concerned, everything and producing a good quality uh, product. I think that's a problem where people will then maybe you know look at their budget and go, that looks like a big number. I might not get this job if I give them this number. So I'm going to give them a smaller number and then get the job. And then you get that job for the smaller number and then everyone has a shitty time and they're not going to be happy with the results. <laughs> You've got to go back to what, you know, as high as that number may be, if that Absolutely. is correctly out- calculated Absolutely. and you're confident, Absolutely. that's the number. I was told by an older makeup artist years and years ago, you go in on an interview and you go in like, uh, you know what, I really don't want this job or I want this job. Either you want the job or you don't want the job. And if you want the job bad enough, then you'll make it work in the budget with it. If you don't want the job, then what the heck, you know, give them a budget that, you know, you think is crazy. Not over, not raping them or whatever the budget, but just give them, you know, what you think it is. But be willing to walk away. And if they see that, if they sense that, and they really want you, then you've got the job. It's... It's all a game. Producers know that. Directors know that. The whole industry knows it's all a game. Because um, you have to play that game. We were chatting the other, uh, earlier about um, like somebody saying, I think it was in a forum, and they were like, oh, "I need this thing. They haven't cast the person yet. They need it like you know a couple of days' time." And then the reference picture they show you that they have to replicate is a makeup, which was presumably, you know, made at great expense from a previous big budget movie. And you kind of go, "Well, I guess you know." There are possibly ways you could cut corners, like maybe that was a life cast and blah, 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 and we could maybe do some flat molds. But the point is, if they're not going to pay for that, or not gonna, it's not your job to reinvent physics or go back in time or somehow go to Polytech and say, can you reduce your prices of your silicons because this guy doesn't want to fucking pay it. It's kind of like, the answer is no. You can't have it for that or you can't have it for then. And no one wants to be that person, but actually sometimes that is the professional <laughs> response. If I went to a restaurant and said, I don't want to pay for my meal, right. what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. wouldn't of course you don't want to pay but for it, it but you everyone know, wants a free meal. But. It's also, so, so yes, I, okay, I'm going to explain to you that this makeup was done for this much money and it was, you know, they took three months to prep it, you know. We don't have that, obviously. I'm going to do the best I possibly can for you to give you this makeup. Yeah. What you can do for the money you have and the time you have. Yes. But and also, that's all you can do it. And yeah. also... At some point, you go, you know, and if I don't, if I don't sound convincing to you, or you don't trust me, then please go to somebody else that will do it. Yes, please, yes. because I don't want to spin my wheels, nor do you. So let's just deal with people like this. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Because <laughs> you'll have, I'm sure you'll have done it too where you've given a quote they say no someone came in cheaper and then you hear a year later everyone had an awful time they didn't oh, work and, so lots you know, of and you go that's why lots I don't want those. to have a shitty job that I regret for very little money yes. that's, you know, the race to the bottom is you might win and <laughs> I know <laughs> that's the problem and, with and, it. and the thing about that you learn over time too is to trust your instincts about everything you know and Towards, I would say, the last twenty years of my uh, my my professional career, I had a really good instinct about a production. If I if it didn't feel right, then I would I would say, you know what, I'm either really busy, or mm, this doesn't sound like what I I can do for you. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you you need to be faithful to yourself as well as and don't try to be the hero even though you want to be and it feels good to be. It doesn't pay off in the end. Sometimes you're going to come out the worst you could ever come out in a mm. project. And you'll look a lot better, I think, probably holding your head high saying, no, I can't do it for that, but best of luck. That's right. So obviously th- television is really fast-paced. You're doing an episode every seven, eight days, six days, whatever it is nowadays. Um, uh, y- y- and, and it's like a full-length motion picture, but it's broken up into 24 episodes. It's broken up into 12 episodes. You understand that. Sometimes you know the arc of where they're going. Sometimes you have no idea because they don't know. They'll get together in the writer's room and plan out the whole season, and this is the arc we're going to do. But within that, we're going to have these little quirks, you know. Well, a film's not like that. You have a set script, kind of. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's constantly (laughs) flowing. It's an art, right? Yeah. You have everything that you need in that script to do. Obviously, the you can work with the writers, and you can work with the director of how it's going to be. In the olden days, <laughs> which was, you know, when we started in the career 40 years ago, visual effects was non-existent, or it was really rotoscope bad stuff. It was separate shots. Separate right. shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had to come up with ways of doing things that would now be done in a second with visual effects now. So changing a girl into a fish amphibian creature or something. How are we going to do that? Well, you get the script, you read it, you break it down, you have your meeting with your producer, director, and your cinematographer. And you go, how can we do this? Yeah. You know, how can we do this? Let's talk about it. And it's and, and there's nothing like there's nothing like that feeling of the when the creative juices get flowing with people that you really like to work with, there's nothing like that in the world. Once you start Oh yeah, I can do this, and we can do this with the camera, and we can tilt the camera, or we can shoot it this way and then reverse it, or shoot it in a lower frame speed or higher, you know. And this was film days, you know. And it's the same thing today, but it's a little bit more complex, obviously, with technical. So uh, again, it's the same as television, but it's just a longer schedule, you know, and. You're working on something for a little longer. Now, these days, a little longer means maybe it's the same time as a television show because these films are put together sometimes independently and you have a lot of things going on. So I think it's a matter of just working with each department on it. If a clo- clothes have to rip, what is the costume uh, people going to do? with the special effects people, with the makeup effects people, you know. So you've got to work out your your, your dance, you're going to dance, you know. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you get people that just want to do it all. Oh, yeah, we can do that, and we can do that. Well, you're taking on a lot of stuff, like pumping blood. On CSI, for instance, going back to television, every time something had to pump or goo or blood or anything, special effects would take that up. And I would gladly give it to them because they knew how much pressure to use, how what density, what what's the what's the size of the tube, what's the outlet, you know, everything. So it was so much easier to do our work and make it look good than they pump the blood and work with that. Mm -hmm. So working with that. And it's the same with working in film, it's working out that dance between somebody you've never worked with and yourself who knows how things work and who's going to do what mm-hmm. in this particular effect. Yeah. So uh, designing a character in film is sometimes I'll, I'll get a script. They have no idea what they want, you know, and I'll, I'll have to go back and I said, now we can do this one of two ways we can do this long very very expensive way of i start coming up with things 
and you start paying me and it just goes on and on and on or go to the internet go to a book and find out send me a few pictures of what you think looks good and what what your idea of this character would be and that gives them a sense of sometimes i think that they're thinking that i'm being lazy but you've got to start have a point to start with that you both agree on. Yes, when you kind of judge their taste. You join exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's much easier to start out that way and go, okay, I can work with that. Let me do a design now that you've already come up with uh, um, the looks of what you think you want. And then it then it's much easier to flow into that character rather than just grabbing out of air for something, for a design or something. And so once you've come up with a design, then if you have time, and most of the time they give you time, to do the makeup and then do a test. Now, doing a test on an actor, I like, this is kind of underhanded, but I like to go behind production's uh, back Sometimes you can't and get with the actor and do a makeup. So that serves two purposes. One, that you get to bond with the actor. And two, that you both come up with a design that you like. Yeah. And the actor will stand behind you. But yet you still have the directors and the producers uh, wants and needs in your the back of your pocket, you know. Yeah. And it really gives you time to bind with the actor, which is very important, because they're the first person that you see in the morning, and they're the last person you see at night. If they've had a bad day the night before, they've had a fight with their spouse, you know, you have to deal with that. You have to learn how to keep your mouth shut, or if they want to talk, you talk, you know. But it's their it's their time in that chair, you know, in the morning, getting into that character, and you need to understand, it's not about you, it's about them. They're going to be on screen. Yes, it's going to be your makeup, but they're going to be on screen performing in that makeup. So you better be well aware of their attitude that day, and where they're coming from. And if they don't want to talk, you need to shut up. You know, otherwise, everybody's not going to get along. You know, so you know you come you come up with a design. You've done a makeup. If you can do it with the actor, you know you one on one, or you do it with a small crew. And if you don't want to be underhanded and, and know that this is not the time to do that, go to the director, go to a producer, and say, okay, I need I I would love time with the actor just to do this on my own. Sometimes they get scared because they don't have any balls. Mm-hmm. And they go, uh, the director you know, wants to be there. And I said, okay, okay. Well, then let us have our time before anybody comes in an hour or two to bond, three hours, whatever, to do this makeup and come up with our idea. And then let's show it to you guys. You know, and, and, and let's talk about this, honestly. Mm-hmm. What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? You know, you could ask me what I like about it and don't like about it too, but that's inconsequential as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. It's your vision. The director always, nowadays, I don't know how it is. I don't know. I just don't, I don't, I don't think it's the way it was in the good old days. Uh, but the director was always the captain of the boat. His his vision is this film. Nowadays, you have seven to ten producers that they each want to get in their ideas. Thank God I'm not in the industry anymore. I'd lose jobs on this. But they all want their little slice of the pie. They're all too many chefs in the kitchen. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, it's true. And it's like, guys, and I've been on those productions that are like that. And I finally, I just throw my hands up on guys. 
Can we just come to a decision here? This thing works tomorrow. I can't throw another makeup together here. So we need to come to a decision here. You know, finally putting your foot down and going, fuck, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but, you know, we need to we need to figure this out. Yes. You know, you're this one's saying this, this one's saying this. Come on, we've got to come together. Yeah. On this. Yeah. Sure, give me two more months. Oh, well, we it's, don't have that. No. Well then you need to wrap it up into a decision. Yeah. That's the thing, no one wants to commit, but it's it all starts off with this big vague nebulous bubble and then Nobody down. wants to commit because they don't want to lose their job. Yeah. They that don't is. they don't have the balls to do it, you know. And Another thing today, the producers and directors let these actors get away with murder. And they don't have the balls to say, sorry, but we can't do that anymore. The golden age of, of film is gone, where the, the head of the studio said, you're going to do this. No, I'm not. Yes, you are, or we can tear up your contract and go out on the street. And it wasn't like the way it was today. Of course, it was a different time. It was different, you know. But um, I don't know. It, it's it's hard these days, <laughs> you know. So, did I digress? No, that Sorry. was awesome. All right. that was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> did I answer your question about putting a film together? I think so. Yeah, yeah, that was it. It was. It's that thing of like just that's all the hidden stuff that isn't really discussed. Oh, yeah, it's there's a lot of work goes into. Figuring out what's going to be done before anyone lets a tool you need to figure and out. And you are not God, even though you think you're the God's gift to art and makeup. I'm sorry, but no matter how good you are, how good your quality of work is, I'm sorry, you. There are other people you have to work with. Mm-hmm. It's not your say, and this is the way the makeup's going to be. If you want to continue working, you have to work with other people. Yeah. You can't, you know, of course, it doesn't mean that you need to be shy about what you, you just have to have, you know, chutzpah. Yeah. You know, you have to, you have to know what you're doing too. And, and knowing what you're doing just comes with years and years of experience. Yeah, that's you can't practice, jump into you know, it. Practice after. is so important. I think this is one of the dangers of thinking. Again, when people are qualified, when they you know leave makeup oh, school, or whatever they they're qualified to do what exactly? Because I don't think anyone's ever told them. Look, you may know you know the set of skills you've been able to cram into you know three months or a year or two years or whatever, but it's not the same as an apprenticeship for six years or whatever, and then yeah. you know working down the summer for five years. And sadly, those jobs are very hard to come by. Mm-hmm. And I know that mm-hmm. the studio system doesn't work like that anymore, but. That's what you're up against right. if you're trying to think of the right. good old days and those are the books you've read and it's kind of different. But you, you do, you still need to be competent. Uh, so if someone says, we're going to do this, how long is it going to take? You need to have done things like that oh, sure. lots of times sure. to look at that and go, that's a half hour paint job. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And so unless you've that done you know what a you're thousand paint jobs, you've no business and being in that position where you're going to quote for it. But a lot of people don't want to put those right. hours in or feel that they can market their way to the top without right. having to do the groundwork. Right. And they're doing themselves and everybody else a disservice because until you fall from grace, right. you don't realize how fucking hard you can fall. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm accused of doing that too coming out of Blasco school because I thought I knew everything there was to know about makeup because you come out of the school and you think, I'm invincible, I can do it. And I did that. And I fell on my face a couple of times, you know, because I messed up on a job. But I learned from that. You know, I learned from it, and it makes you a better person to fail. Mm-hmm. A much better person. If you learn from your failure, and your failure can teach you so much if you learn to listen to it and listen to your voice inside and your creative voice, you know. And and I'm sorry I'm going to say this, but not thinking that your shit don't stink and, and this is the way it's going to be and... I'm sorry, this is the end all be all of what you're gonna get, you know. You know, it's it's you can always learn from other people. You can always learn from the next job or the last job or uh just remember what you do. And Dick Smith, when I met with him uh in nineteen eighty, I was doing a film in New York and I some pickups and I called him up and asked him if I could come out and visit him. This is the beginning of my career. 
as I moved to Hollywood in 1977, and and this was 1980, I think we were doing a show anyway. So I went out and visited with him, and um, first thing he did was give me a pencil and paper, and said, uh, "You may want to write anything down. You should hear anything." And I was so impressed with that, that he was so open with his information. And I took note about that. When you give to other people and you share your knowledge, that will come back tenfold. Mm -hmm. If you're very close with your information and think you're doing yourself a justice and by holding that information, I'm going to get more work, you're sadly mistaken. Because you're going to limit yourself, you're going to become arrogant to other people. You're you're not going to learn. So you, it just it just pays to be more open with your information, and you, we could all learn from each other, you know everything. But it was so liberating to hear him talk about things and his passion for for materials and the art of makeup. And um, I was just, I came away from, I spent all day with him. He fed me lunch and I, I spent all day with him and I just learned so much in that one day, that 10 hour day period that I was just, I, it just it gave me a new opening in, in my makeup field. <laughs> I think that's perfect. That, that was is? perfect. Okay, good. That's this is in de- depth of what goes on yeah. behind the scene. Yeah, I mean, we hey. can read about that stuff, but yeah. this is yeah, yeah, we'll read about it. It's all okay. good. Thank you so much. Really it was a pleasure. That. It was a pleasure. And um, one little thing, I don't know if you do this for flat. Well, you probably don't even need to. It depends what kind of silicon you're using. But I tend to use silicon that takes a few hours to set up, so I do to gas it. Most of the time, I'll use um, Mold Star Thirty. That's my my go to for the flat molds. But it's it's thin enough that you know it's a takes about four hours for it to yeah. go off, and it, I think it's got a working time of at least thirty to forty five minutes. So okay. I don't I don't need to degas it because it'll it'll take Self care de-gas. of itself. Yeah. Okay, because one of the little things, I mean, I have been degassing mine, because, well, in summer, they, they set up pretty quick, because I'm using, like, you know, similar kind of, you know, a, a reasonably firm shore silicone. But I also have, like, uh, you know, the spray silicon release, which is just basically, like, silicon oil in a can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spray, a, once you poured your flat moles, I tend to spray the back with that, and it helps pop the air bubbles, because it just breaks the surface tension on the back. Oh. Well, um, try that. Give that a little try. I mean, obviously, if you pour them high up and you've degassed, it's fine. But I've just found that you get little air bubbles that are kind of struggling to come through, especially as it's setting up. Yeah. And then if you spray that on the back, it suddenly they'll just go pop, 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 and pop. And um, just kind of helps with that. Uh, there was an interesting discussion, actually, last week about the whole flat mold silicon thing. Because I quite like, and I'm, you're, you're clearly the same, I, I like quite a firm silicon for mm-hmm. my flat molds. Because when you scrape a flat mold, you obviously put weight down on it with the scraper. So yeah, 30, if you have a soft silicon, the 30 it will shore is, is about as, that's sometimes even too soft, but you don't want to, you don't want to go any softer than a 30 shore. No, no. Just because when you scrape it, like I say, it'll just, it'll sometimes push more out. Cause you know what it's like when you've got, because just the nature of the way fluids work, when you scrape silicon, it will always look slightly underfilled. Right. Which is, I think how it should look. Could then you get the little meniscus, that little mm-hmm. curve of Which the silicon. Which actually is, is okay if, if it's slightly underfilled and even encapsulated it. Yes. Then it's it's going to apply beautifully. Yeah, because it'll be slightly underfilled. But it's it, slightly it underfilled. Look, yeah, it can look like it's wrong, but it's not. But that's why you know you don't want to use a soft. You want to use gel ten. That's way too soft. I mean, yeah. you can, it does work, but it's not mm-hmm. optimal. Yeah, I've done some stuff with. Um, 15 and 16 sure that that works but you just have to be really careful about how you're scraping it it's kind of a fine line because if you go for a firmer silicone like a 45 shore which is perfect in terms of the ability to scrape it Mm -hmm. then if you've made a piece that's got some delicate undercut type things in there 
a 45 shore might be too hard, especially when you, when you're trying to demold mm. it from from mm. a rigid piece originally. Mm. You're going to want I think to one of the it. things I've noticed with the hardest, you know, the hardest silicons is they tend to be much less fluid necessarily. I suppose so when you do when you do degas yeah. them, yeah. you need like you know an inch in a bucket of silicon will expand up to like eighteen inches in the bucket under under vacuum. Um, <laughs> so you know. It can be a bit of a chore trying to degas anything of, of, of any amount because you end up having to distribute it over three or four buckets and it takes ages to do it. Right, and and trying to degas silicone at, at the elevation I'm at, um, you can't get 30 inches of, of mercury. You can only get about right. 27, 28. Uh, yeah, you got all that altitude so, going on for you. Yeah, so, so you have to degas for a longer period of time eats into your gel your cure time yeah it's not always eats, in, yeah. eats into Especially the if you've got in, like 20 moles to pour, yeah you know you're not gonna you know by the time you get to mold number five and it started turning into jello you're like oh shit yeah smooth on's got some some um fairly new tin silicones that are really fluid um but they don't have quite the the firmness that we we'd like to have you know, if they could come out with a uh, a thirty five or a forty shore in this uh, Novak, you don't have to degas it because it's it pours up yeah. so that's interesting beautifully. Yeah, because I've noticed um, uh, for flat molds, uh, well, it depends what kind of mold you're making. Because obviously, over I don't know if I'm right in saying this, but it feels like in the states there seems to be more of when you do like the the prose transfers. There seems to be more people uh, applying it through the transfer paper, whereas in the UK, I don't know if it's true, but in the UK, it feels like a lot more people tend to apply from the mold. So the mold is actually what you apply to the surface and peel it back. Right. Obviously, you, you, you don't have to do it that way. I'm just saying it's. It just seems like whenever I've mentioned that technique, uh, it seems to be the maybe because the paper is more readily available in the states. I don't know. Could be. Um, but if you're going straight from the mold onto the skin, then a softer silicone's going to be beneficial. It's quite useful. Yeah. Well, because I think of the way the way you fill it with Pro Bondo is slightly different because you've got the time to kind of scrape it back and you, you're not going to be damaging any cat plastic. Right. But one thing I've noticed is that it comes out of tin molds much easier than platinum silicon molds mm-hmm. because platinum <clears throat> silicons typically are quite dry. They're not oily. Obviously, which is why we make you know pieces out of them because there are no nasty oils leaking out. Yeah. But it's interesting to think that that oiliness also helps the thing come out, which is quite useful. <laughs> what I've what I've started doing, yeah. and I, I, I took this as a tip from um, from Christian Tinsley uh, with with their prosthetic transfer material and the the release that that they sell. I can't think of the name of it. The Hyro Slip. Hyro Slip. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you actually get uh, Smooth On has a product called um, Hyperfolic, which mm. is designed to mix in with their body double, life mm-hmm. casting silicone, to, so it will essentially be self releasing. Yep. If you mix that a little of the the Hyperfolic into your silicone flat molds that you're going to be using for Bondo transfers, that helps them really pull out of the mold a oh, lot interesting. easier okay. you basically got that that silicone oil that release that release okay. built into the mold yeah that's interesting because i do think the the very the safe nature of platinum silicons is that they don't leach any you know oils out mm-hmm. it means it's a very dry silicon which means you have to be quite disciplined about release agents when you're doing things like Pro bondos, where you absolutely, the pieces and to come you know, out. even though silicone supposedly you don't need to, re- it's it, you know, nothing sticks to silicone. I've definitely had, had yes, pieces, I've had that pieces not, not want to come, come out. out. Yeah, no, and I agree, and that's one of those things. What I've done in a pinch as well for for a real emergency before, when I didn't have anything um, good to release, was I put in a couple of layers of green marble. 
oh. in the mold first and then then run your pieces as normal you can freeze them and let them dry and then when you apply the piece you'll find that the because the silicon stretches to get it off you end up with flaky shit all over the place you just wipe that down with alcohol and that mm-hmm. goes away but it does a very good it's basically like a sort of a applied prophylactic yeah. surface that you're you know you're going to get rid of it during application but it it pretty much guarantees it's going to come out because I don't know if you and, you and Matthew area. talked about it, um, but what he does when when he's doing prosaic transfers, he'll use one of his sealers oh, in yeah. the mold, yeah. and then he'll he'll spatulate the 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 prosaic the bondo into the mold, scrape it, and he'll just let it air dry, mm-hmm. and peel it out so that it's sticky, and then he can melt that. The edges of his sealer. Yeah, his sealers are fucking amazing. Those soft yeah. sealers are incredible. Yeah. So nice. Um, yeah, I'm going to... Uh, yes, now that you say that, I do remember him talking about that because we did that in the class that he taught at a Brick in the Yard. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's interesting because it's one of those things that, aside from the fact it gives you a nice surface that you know does release out of the mold nice and easy does blend out the other thing i think is important is that it gives you a surface which isn't a prosade surface Mm -hmm. because obviously one of the things about pro bondo pieces is that they can look great when they're on but because they're actually essentially a lump of glue they remain potentially tacky throughout the day so you may powder it and be fine but if you're somewhere where it's dirty or dusty or blowy like in the desert or you're filming somewhere like that it's gonna yeah it attracts all this dirt and it or it comes off of costume or smoke or whatever you know set atmospheric stuff's going on and it can actually look dirty later so actually having having the piece come out with the skin on the surface like that which isn't necessary in the way it is in silicon pieces but it is actually good because it means you come out i mean i guess you could seal pieces afterwards with that sealer but it's nice that it's already on there you know it's 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 Mm -hmm. it's one less thing to do in the chair which is quite nice uh but yeah no i was really impressed and it was all these different color plastics as well we did this burn makeup it was amazing um yeah no it's it's fantastic stuff oh man i'm getting all juiced again <laughs> i've got to stop and do things and, and and go in the house and get the kids to sleep and stuff because it's late but um yeah uh yeah i well, just get all maybe, jazzed about maybe this these are some about. some things that we can f- fabricate and demo when we are at monster palooza yes that would be amazing that would be amazing. We should totally do something like that, especially if we yeah. can video them beforehand so we already have the tutorials that relate to it in advance. Ready All right, let's go. plan on doing that. Oh, one more thing I just want to show you. This is going to be shit for the podcast, but I'll show you because it's on video. One sec. <laughs> so we've just finished um the other day we just finished our uh, airbrush part one of our airbrush article for prosthetics magazine and, i uh, am so excited about this one. Oh, we had so much fun doing it and it was also quite shocking how many how many airbrushes we have between us <laughs> i think i have a problem um bits yeah, of air i we found needed, we needed bits. intervention we do i mean i found bits of an airbrush i have found uh, a part of parts of a pasha h i'm like i don't even have a pasha h i don't know where i accumulate these bits well two of my airbrushes i've had since like 1975 yeah you're saying you've actually airbrushed photographs yeah i yeah i was i yeah i got i have a a a pasha h and and a and an awata that i've had since the mid 1970s and i used to use them to touch up retouch photographs amazing like you you used to when people say it's been airbrushed yeah. it, it literally was it airbrushed literally is airbrushed yeah. before photoshop um so anyway we we had all these really nice uh, airbrushes and i thought do you know what i should do i should do a little video of me putting together cheap airbrushes so i've got a couple of really cheap airbrushes i've got one a friend of uh, we got some f- um, family coming over at christmas and i've asked them to go to harbor freight and get me their ten dollar airbrush <laughs> <laughs> I've got this one, which is probably the UK equivalent yeah. uh, from Clark, which is like £9.50. I paid for that. It's a single-action airbrush, but it will work for cat plastic. Well, the nice thing about these these cheap single-action airbrushes from Harbor Freight or any of the, wherever you can get them is if you fuck it up, grab another one. 
Yeah. Uh, it's because no, it's worth, yeah. no great expense if you've allowed the, the needle to to get rusty or whatever happens to it. You know, something clogs in it. You, you run packs through it and you, you say, well, I'll clean it tomorrow. Yeah, I right, just stick it in well, some acetone. Then, then you just throw it away because you're not going to clean it tomorrow. No. Or ever. Well, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna basically do a video of me assembling this, uh, you know, so you, you can see it uh, unboxed and assembled. I also got this one, which is a really cheap dual action airbrush from Clark uh-huh. as well. This was like twenty quid, but it's essentially <laughs> this. It, I mean, it's not by any stretch of the imagination, you know, a miracle of engineering, but it works. And um, yeah. if you're just there's doing there's no way you're going to get in a water or a or a Pache double action for. For, for that money, no. And, um, and you know, for a tenner, you might as well buy like two or three of them and just keep them in your kit. If you can, if you do a lot of this, it's worth having because then when it does sure. fail, it's not that you can't afford a new one. It's more likely that it'll fail at a time or a place where you can't easily get a replacement. Mm-hmm. So you may as well spend a couple of, you know, a, uh, buy buy two of them so you've got a spare. But I'll, I'll do it as a, as a tutorial for, you know, assembling it and then using it. And then we'll use that with our next tutorial because... Well, which um, I, I am... S- really excited to get started on yeah that we have now we know how to we've shown everyone how to take it apart and put it back together mm-hmm. now let's let's use it yeah man let's Maybe. let's create with it yeah and all the, all the problems as well because like i know when i spray cat plastic i was very eager to sort of demonstrate you know if, if the mix isn't right how the cat plastic strings and shoot mm-hmm. it against black and have a nice, you know, top light to illuminate yeah, the stuff. Yeah, if your stuff. air pressure's not right, you'll you'll get that spider webbing also. Yeah, so it'd be nice to sort of make those things happen and, and document them. And and yes, there'll be video of that. So that's fine. Um, dude, I think I should probably stop because we've got to get stuff done and you've got to get ready and go to Atlanta Yeah, I have to. I have to go pack. Nice one, man. Alrighty. Uh, this was a good one. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, man. I do Matthew appreciate your time. Freaking mongle. Yeah. Fucking hell, man. It was awesome. So much fun. And the, you know what was weird is I listened to it and I got all excited again, even though I was there the first time. And it's just like, oh, man, it's just, it's just infectious because you can see he's having so much fun now, man. Oh, he, yeah. He's it's, enjoying it's, it. It's obvious. He loves what he's doing. And, and now that he's, you know, said goodbye to LA and in down in, in Texas where he makes his home. It's life is good. Yeah, man. I tell you one thing know, that's really I good. I know he's digging it. One thing that's really fun in his workshop is it's uh the it's an old jailhouse, an old police station, and it has a, an actual cell, an actual jail Far cell. Out. A, a genuine like inch thick steel bars jail cell. And uh, he's he's done it out with all kinds of cool Halloween stuff in there. It's fucking brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to dig through some pictures and put them on the uh, on the show notes in the podcast episode. Sweet. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just fantastic. So yeah, I mean, I mean, you've never seen anyone have so much fun, and it's just like he's still got all the skill set, still fit and healthy, but he's just not bogged down with the bullshit of you know film industry getting in the way of stuff. He's just having a great time, and it's it's amazing. Yeah, well, he's. He's he's you know taking a page out of the out of the Steve Laporte and Rick Rick Baker playbook where you know essentially retired to something rather than from something and he's he's doing it on his terms. Yeah, and it's great to see. And he's having a lot of fun doing it. It's oh, it's fantastic. As he should. Yeah. All right, dude. Thank you very much. I will talk to you soon I'll, I'll give you a shout from atlanta yes man awesome thank you very much you bet take care okay. fella bye